Okay? Yes. Is this microphone actually working? Yes. You sure, man? What I've noticed, right, is that whenever I speak on mic, people stop listening to me and don't even talk to me. Is it my lack of deodorant that I'm wearing glasses? I don't know if you noticed. Please talk amongst yourselves. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll talk some more. And these are my new glasses. I got them from Japan. And um, did it suit me, bro? Does anybody else see these glasses suit me? Yes. Thank, thank you, Joy. Joy's come all the way from Jamaica to actually tell me that my glasses suit me. Thank you. Your glasses suit you as well, sis. Um, excuse me at the back. Can you hear me? You can? Okay, thank you very much. We're going to start in about five minutes' time. And it seems like my voice is fighting over your voices. Only it's not going to happen in five minutes' time. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> Just like Bill Withers. Where is Bill? Come on, Bill! <laughs> huh? Sorry. Microphone check, one, two. Thank you very much. Excuse me, young sir. What's your name? What? Yeah, this is funny. When you actually, these are my new glasses, my brother. I'm actually looking you clean in your face, and you actually said me. <laughs> Do you have a brother? How's the family? Thank you very much. Why are you never asked me about my family? I'm not telling you now, you've upset me. You've offended me now. I'm leaving. Don't worry, bro. We're still friends. I like a bit of shandy. Okay? No halves. Early pies. Okay? That's right. I can hold it, bro. I'm a big man. Look at my feet. That's right. That's me, that. You all ready? Oh, mouse, ready? Okay. Um, before we actually start the whole proceedings and everything, uh, let me explain to you who I be. My name is G-Man. Uh, do you all know me? You, do you know me? You do? Now you do. Okay, uh, pleased to meet you. Thank you. Um, before we actually go into the proceedings, uh, somebody sent me a text and said to... Why are you all talking about yourselves? Oh. Microphone people, listen to the one voice, don't talk amongst the, yourselves, it's so, so painful. But anyway, um, Sasha, you sent me a text and you said to remember... Oh, gee. <laughs> um, basically, um, you can do live tweeting today. Um, we, you can follow us at MeWeZen. And the hashtag is hashtag MeWeZenTalk. So please tweet away. I'm sure you'll be very inspired today. I'll pass it back to G. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, round of applause for Sasha. <laughs> um, I've got to give you one warning. You appear to be a very reserved crowd. No. Forget the reservedness, right? Just relax, chill, dust, clean your teeth because God gave you yellow teeth for a reason, okay? No problem. Second thing I was told to announce. Oh gosh, what was the second thing? <laughs> um, gosh, Ava, can you help me please? Yeah, Ava, come on. You with the cheeks. Yeah. Come on, take your time. No rush. Ava, uh, please. Come here, don't. I know I smell, but I'm working on it, okay? So Ava, a little birdie has told me that it's your, is it your birthday? Tomorrow, tomorrow. So I'm not one to embarrass people because that's one thing I don't do. I will not embarrass you, Ava. I won't let, Dawn, where's Dawn? Come here, please. Um, it's not about embarrassing, it's about honoring people, okay? Look at the face, look at the, look at the face, yeah? Dawn, please. Do you know what? I, I, I was going to go along with you. Yeah. I know it's your birthday. But we could sing Happy Birthday. Why can't we? We can. Yeah. I said we could. We can sing Happy yes. Birthday. However, <laughs> Ava's a singer. Woo! So should we sing Happy Birthday and then you sing the song you sang for us last time? No. I did say did sing Happy Birthday. Okay. Really? Yeah. Alright, which version would you like? Happy Birthday to you.
now we can start. Okay, this young man who, to me, is a very, very talented young man. Yes, I know I'm a very talented man also, but it's not about me. I'm not a boastful person, as you know that, even though my glasses look wonderful on me. Let me introduce this young man. I heard this um, video a few weeks ago, and it was him talking about one of his aspirations was to be a pilot, okay? Now, when I was a kid, right, what my dream and aspiration was, was to get through to 17 years of age before my dad killed me, right? I remember my dad used to say this wonderful term of endearment, right? And it brings tears to my eyes as I speak now, I'm, I'm kind of filling up. My dad used to always say to me, he said to me, and I'm trying to get this right now, he'd say, if you was a fowl, I'd wring your neck. <laughs> now, I don't know what that means, but I, I, I thought it must be something that means something deep, because he used to like shake with, shake with happiness. <laughs> so, um, that's what my aspiration was, was just to get to my 60th birthday. But this man is older than 16, an incredible talent. Put your hands together for Raphael Blake. Thank you very much. Hello, Lee Wee Zen. My name is Raphael. Uh, make some noise for you, you're for yourselves if you are not feeling good today. Great. Um, so I'm going to be reciting some spoken word for you guys today. Um, it's from my upcoming project that's due for release at the end of this year. It's called the it's broken down into three parts basically. So the first year is uh, the, the first, or oh, the first part is the first year, the theme of ambition. The second year, reality. The final year, sacrifice. Um, and each poem taken from this concept follows those themes. And there's 18 tracks of poetry and music. Um, and the piece I'm going to take from the project for you today and perform uh, is taken from the final year, the year of sacrifice. Just talking about, I guess, you know, we all go through life and there are things that we have to give up or there are things that we end up losing in the pursuit of our ultimate goal. Um, and this piece is called Blowtorch. Shine. The blue flame of a blazing blowtorch at the back of your iris. And you'll understand how I felt when I saw those police sirens flash, flash, flashing through my door at New Year's Eve. Mum, I would have handed you the keys. You didn't have to call the police, I was just trying to understand what masculine means. I mean, you sent me to school for 17 years, and my life's only been more positive about Dad's hostility ever being there. So I don't mean to have broad shoulders, but this testosterone was moulded by my peers and what I saw as the world's idea. And you know the respect has always been there because that's mandatory. And I've always tried to understand the way that you handle me. I mean, maybe in the picture of your future, I'm just not the man that you plan to see. I'm not living life the way that you wanted, to me, wanted me to lead. But I'm sorry. Uni just wasn't for me. Not that it never will, it's just that £27,000 is a lot to spill if it's not going to give me the practical skills to help me establish what I truly want to build. I mean, I'm sorry I'm not a pilot yet, but I'm going to fly you back to your new home in Florida as soon as I get my private jet. I promise. Because a man is not considered accomplished if he can only cater to himself. I mean, I watched a documentary the other day about endangered gazelles and even the male antelope had to drop kick another in a chin to win protection over everyone else. Plus he won all the girls. So I know that everything is off track. Has been ever since those four officers tore me away from our home. From our home. From your flat. But I am still out here fighting for a better life just to bring you back. Thank you. up a bit and I'll take something um, from the first year, the theme of ambition, um, and this one's called Dinosaur, um, and I guess the underlying question was that when I left college, you know, how much did I know about, I guess, the options available to me and everything I wanted to do at leaving college, you know? Um, I was told that the only way to kind of achieve that 
well, well, the only way to achieve what I wanted to achieve was through university. Um, but I had questions surrounding that. And I went on to uh, go on an apprenticeship, which kind of gave me, you know, kind of practical skills and, and, and a real experience. Um, and it should make sense. It's called dinosaur. You see, on my last day of school, I folded text dictations and I shot them into dinosaur fuller schools. Those traditional rules began to, they began to perspire when it was quite apparent that I wouldn't follow norms, but without an independent cause would anyone ever implement reforms. I mean, it's the principle. I've got some deodorizing self-assurance. Sure helps me keep it cool. And I do appreciate those smiley stickers and green ticks, but the state of those strong rainforest pits display that biologically you are a non-conformist, because I'm guessing that you're not supposed to be sweating right now, but... Can everyone hear me about the microphone? Yeah. 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 Uh, the microphone is so do, you need, do you need it for the, uh, for the cameras, though? Yeah. 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 Uh, sure. That's cool. Science is a statement. Science is a statement to me. It's not just what you do say, it's everything you don't say that speaks. You see, words, words have power, but silence, silence hurts more. Like your dad getting married, and imagine the only way you managed to find out was from going back and finding pictures on the wall. But pictures still paint a thousand words. Ain't it funny how a single picture is a thousand ways to say Why did your mother have to give birth? It would have been easier for me and her if you were still sperm Well I didn't plant the seed And now my life is bearing fruits You wanna claim and harvest me But when mum and I were trooping through Where were you? Armored up in another excuse Blowing up forgotten times in your infamous zoo Just batting at a lack of contraception you've used I mean, it's true, because reproduction's a ball. As long as you remain aware of where the repercussions could fall, because you could score a goal on a call, or you could get ordered to call and spend the rest of the game being forced to pay a child support. But it's just a game, of course, and your red card made me. So round of applause. Now it's me that's breaking all the rules, so you can't pretend the ball doesn't resemble the sport. But silence is a statement. So now it's just me staring back at you, hoping that time will be more gracious. Cause you fathered my muscles to exercise patience. Just left me there waiting on the stairs with my little hands and ears cold. So at six years old, I decided that you was nobody's hero. And ever since that day, I've been slipping from your cape. With your bearded face caught in the grips of my innocent gaze. And the burning along the way made calluses take shape on my sense of pride. You see, your abandoned place could have made me want to end this life But instead I found inside a place full of power and endless drive Cause it's not just what you do say It's everything what you don't say that speaks And I haven't heard from you in years But your voice still reverberates between my ears And now that I've let go Reassurance black rises between those brightening echoes And I can see through all the tears but these water vapors, they could have steamed my heart with hatred But I contain them and I use them like gems to decorate my double glazing So if all you are to me now is a mere condensation I love you even more for that dad Cause now my children will get to spend their days in Running their fingerprints through the progress of my dripping ventilation You will see them tracing around the reflection of their own found elation So I want you to accept this picture frame that can as their gleaming faces is my statement and celebration for this life that you decided to leave vacant and keep it with your window pain because we mark the start of a healing generation a grandfather you are to me because you set the example of everything I shouldn't be and that alone deserves my appreciation because silence is a statement silence is a statement to me it's not just what you do say it's everything that you didn't say that speaks. Thank you.
Is your mic working? Is his mic working? Is not my mic working? I mean, I don't know if you know, but I've been to poetry myself. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, while I was sitting there, I borrowed Dr. Martin's Glynn's pen and I kind of felt inspired to, bro. Oh, wow, amazing. There's one bit that I that's cool. Just the words. It can work, it can work. You can, yeah? Yeah, yeah? Okay, so, what do you think about this? Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe the children are the future. <laughs> Teach them well and let them lead the way. And that's teeth, as far as I got. Teeth! Uh, I think. Teeth! Copyright teeth! I don't understand what people are heckling. I don't I know. <laughs> it's to do with the glasses. It must be the glasses, bro. Maybe if you put them back on, they'll, they'll understand. Yeah, well, it, Maybe that one. But I think it's a good point you make though, to be honest. I think so too, bro. It could catch on, bro. I, I reckon, you know. Thank you. You've got and the second one. Start, yeah. Thank you, bro. Thank you. And the second one, this is, this is for my gut, mm. right? Mm. So when he was talking, I, mm. I thought, I'm feeling up, I'm feeling up. Be mm. strong, be strong. Mm. Um, I wrote this one. I'll tell me what you think about this. Sure. But uh, don't be too harsh, Simon. Okay? <laughs> I like tea. <laughs> You like tea. We like tea. You know this song? No A tea he That's beautiful, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, you can put them into your collection if you want to. It's no. free. No. No. Put it to me, bro. Put it to me. Send me an email. No problem. Can make it work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah. This is the last point for anyone that wants to be able to find any of the work I've got at the moment. RaphaelBlake.com, Twitter at RaphaelBlake, Facebook RaphaelBlake. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You're still with me? Yes. I hear four people, but yes, there's seven people in the room, okay? Are you still with me? Yes! Thank you very much, young people, and not so young. This person that I'm going to introduce next, let me try and give you some kind of picture. Now, I sat down with him a few minutes ago, and we had a little conversation. And what he has done in his life, I find extraordinary. There are people who have done one aspect that's amazing, like my good self, okay? Uh, oh dear, that hurts. That did really hurt. Then there's other people who do stuff across the board. What I would suggest you do, there's a microphone at the end that we're going to pass around so you can ask questions. But this man, I'm not going to embarrass him, but I keep telling you what a wonderful story he has to tell. All I'm going to say to you is put your hands together for Dr. Martin in criminology. Um, I'm clever. I've got no common sense. Um, and I explain what I mean is I can't garden, I can't decorate. The only thing I've got is a brain. Um, when I'm working in prison, the guys ask me that question. They say, why do you do what you do? And I remember one day I was with a group of gang members and, uh, in Birmingham and this youth worker introduced me, he said, Martin's a criminologist, so this gang member comes up and he said, you criminologist? And he thought criminologist meant that he was a criminal. And he said, have you ever robbed anybody or shot somebody? I said, no. So he, says, you, he said, you can't be a criminologist. I said, in that definition, it makes you a criminologist. Voice, Because my whole life has been spent giving a platform to whether it's sex offenders, terrorists. I mean, as a lecturer, I've got a student who's deaf. I've had students who are autistic. At university, I'm the person, if you're a goth, gay, if you're middle class and you're into shoplifting, I'm just one of them people people talk to. So in a sense, really, I'm just, I'm just an advocate for people with no voice. It's as simple as that. And um, you know what I mean? That's, that's the way I see myself. I, I don't see myself as, um, you know people say, do you think you got it? I don't think I got a job. I, I, right now I'm just preparing, when God calls me back, God's gonna say, what have you done with the life I gave you? Because a lot of us, we don't think about that. I'm 57, so I'm right now. 
Because I know I'm going to be in a room like this and God's going to play that. He's going to boom. And I'll be thinking, that's my life. So I've dedicated my life to people. I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm broke. There's three types of broke. Um, broke. Broke is if you got, you know if you need 30 pounds, you Primark, you know, get lots of clothes. Broke is if you got 25 pounds, you need 30. Broke. You know what broke is? Broke is when you need 30, you got five, and it's the K. K is when you have nothing. I'm around people that have nothing. I'm around people that go to food banks. I'm around people who just lost their mortgage and are homeless. I'm around gang members who we've told them to give up committing crime. And they have, on Monday they were selling crack and making five grand a week. Now they've gone to nothing and they can't claim social. So for me, the good thing about having nothing, I've developed a way of living with nothing because if I come to your yard and I see a shirt, I got this from TV. If your shirt's longer than two years old and it fits me, I wear it. And in the, because I do so much work in community, I've only got to sit there like a child and go, oh God, man, my bed is killing me. I said, oh, do you want another piece, Martin? Do you want some chips? So I've found a way, right, in spite of being broke. So for me, imagine Bob's Bunny with a PhD. I'm Bob's Bunny or a Nancy or Bray Rabbit. I'm that, I, that's what I am, that's what you're looking at. I'm a trickster who is very clever. That's it. Now, when I listen to this man, right, he was explaining his life, etc., what he's gone through. Now, you mentioned just in passing, when we was out there, about you had many attempts on your life in prison. Was that when you were incarcerated or was it part of your work? You know, funny, funny thing is, I've never ever been in prison. Really? Never been to prison in my life. life. The man's them never understand that. You know, um, never been in prison. I've been working in prison for 35 years. I've never been in prison. That wasn't the motivation for going, but no, I've never been. Now, for those who don't know your story, how did you go from, you know, you're from Nottingham, is that correct? Yep, I'm from Nottingham. Right, so you went from Nottingham, then you, there's nothing wrong with Nottingham, by the way. I'm just pointing that out on the camera. Well, I'm in Derby, isn't it? So I've got to say, yeah, I love Derby. <laughs> yeah. I'll be honest, can I just say this? Push it when I was a youth, yeah, I used to follow V Rocket and uh, I follow Sound System. Derby used to have a little club down there because anytime you wanted to get out of the madness, you come to Derby. Because Derby was like the easiest option, or Leicester. But I used to come to Derby. But the thing is, you know, is that everybody else from Nottingham used to come to Derby. So you think, oh, I'm going to just come out of Nottingham. But you go to the club, and it's, it's like pure Nottingham people in the Derby club. <laughs> so, so for me, but yeah, Derby was always a place to come and. Rave, and actually, Derby used to get a lot more Cox and Mafia, all of the Santa systems were playing Derby, and sometimes we'll play Nottingham. So, I'm not going to knock Derby. I'm, neither will I. So, you started off, right? Did you leave, go to normal school? Explain your background. I, you know, I'm a, as a criminologist or a social scientist, I, I don't know what normal is, if okay. I'm being honest. But it, just for your benefit, anybody here studying sociology? The benchmark for normal is middle class white and male. So if you deviate from it, you deviate. So to me, I've created a new benchmark. So to me, I'm normal and everybody else is not. Um, strangest thing happened, and I said this a while back. In 1955, my mother, who was from Wales, she just decided she didn't want to live in Wales anymore. She took some money, a bit like a prodigal son, took money, got on a train, ran out of money, she got kicked off the train in Nottingham. She had nowhere to sleep, so her first night in Nottingham was in the police station. Anyway, in 1955, this young woman, this white woman from Wales, she saw my father in Nottingham in 1955. He was a Jamaican. Anyway, one thing led to another, and my dad must have said to my mom, you want to have sex. My mum didn't know what sex was, so she went to the doctors and she said, anybody knows this, if you're over a certain age, the doctor prescribed my mum what's called pessimists. Anybody know what pessimists is? It's a different form of contraception that you're supposed to put somewhere, but my mum ended up swallowing it. She swallowed it. She's been up her nose. No, uh, she swallowed it and hence I came along. <laughs> the reality of it is that in 19, oh, July 1957, six months before the race riot in Nottingham. I remember speaking to my mum about this. 
I looked at, I've got a baby book, and I lived in six houses before the age of two, because no dogs, no Irish, no coloreds. And what would happen is, as a white woman, she would leave me, because my father just left. It was too dangerous to stay around. I was born, um, my mum had me in a mother and baby's home, and at the time, fathers weren't allowed to see the child. Anyway, when my mum came out, she would leave me behind a wall, and it would say, rooms available. And she'd turn up and then say, yeah, because she was a white woman. Bring me out, homeless. So my first two years was homeless. Um, between three and five, we lived in St. Anne's when it was a slum. And we never had no bathroom, so we used to go to public baths. So between nine and six, I just used to live in a slum. My mum kind of hid lots of stuff, but I experienced racism. I mean, abuse. My mum used to get milk poured over her head. Um, we went, it was a very unsafe place to be. Then she met a white guy and we got adopted. And I remember being at the end of this table and he signed a piece of paper and then he became, he was very abusive. So I went through from six to 16 with overt physical and racial abuse. So I never actually knew. So I, I became very eccentric. You know, I mean, I know it sounds strange, but you hear about mixed race children scrubbing their skin. I never looked in a mirror until I was about eight. And people used to call me names. These called nigger, coom, they used to call you all these names. And I didn't know what they were. Because prior to that time, I never really met a lot of black people. Because up to the age of about seven and eight, I never really seen black people. So when I was called nigger a lot, I thought that was all right. Never looked in the mirror, and then one day somebody called me a nigger, and I went, came home, and I told her my mum was a bit upset. And I put my hand next to my mum's, and I realised that her skin's different from mine because I thought the white guy was my dad. And then that was when I realised it wasn't. And that was like, I remember 1968 when the Black Power salute. That's when I grew up Afro. That's when I became politicised. That's when I became, I would say, anti-white because the abuse I'd get in the house. So to me, I was politicised as young as ten. That's not normal. So I, for me, I didn't, I didn't know any different. So I became an activist from I was about 10. Simple as that. Um, I used to get racism in the house. Black people would abuse me because they said you're too light. White people would abuse me and say you're too dark. And being mixed race, I must be one of the few people in the country where when a fight broke out at school with the black and white youths, they said I couldn't fight. So I never got hit at school. I was never allowed to fight. They said mine, you, listen, we're going to fight them, they're going to fight. I was never allowed to fight. So even from school, they made me realise I was different. I, I remember my hair was curly, black people would laugh at me. I remember growing up with a, in a white family as a mixed race youth. I used to go to school, eight black people speak like their parents. I remember the first time I heard the word, wah, wah, but I'd never heard it. So I remember at school, coming outside school, and standing next to a group of black people on the outside, and I was just listening. And then the first time I tried to say, wah, wah, it was like, wah, wah, you know what I mean? And then they slapped me up a couple of times. And then eventually, when I was about 12, I left home when I was 12. Yeah. But I couldn't take it, left. And then I met some older black women. And at the age of 12, this group of older black women teach me how to look after my skin. Come on, mum couldn't do it. Touch me how to cook. When you lot were running up and down on Saturday, I was with these women and they taught me how to cook look after my skin, how to talk this way. So you might as well say, my mum gave birth to me and she did her best. My stepfather was abusive, but it was this group of elderly black women who helped raise me in a way that I never, they gave me love for the first time, because all I remember up today is 16 is abuse. Black and white people, I, I, you know, and I used to, and I'm, I'm still very public about this, that we talk about racism, but you know, I made it my commitment never to ever let anybody go through what I went through as a child. I never had no child. It was just abusive. But it's just nowadays, if I was growing up now, then social services, there was no social services then. My, my stepfather used to pick me up on my ankles and drop me on my head. And he was tough. He was like Popeye, he had big arms, he was tough. And the interesting thing is, he taught me my love of reading. I didn't realise until he died, really, that he'd fought in the Second World War against Mussolini and he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, he took it out of me. And so in a way, I don't have a concept of normal, even though I'm 57. 
Because everything I've ever done in my life, to me, seems normal until you talk to someone who says it's normal. So I, I don't have a concept of what normality is. So how did you overcome? I presume you did overcome. Overcome what? Just in terms of... Just that, that upbringing. That didn't. didn't. Traumatised. Um, to this day, I was depressed. I, I did some, you know, like, have you ever seen that program on TV where you find your relatives? What's it called? Um, Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Well, I, I traced my whole family. I traced my mum's family back to Charles I, and I traced my father's family back to Nigeria. I did this, like, many, many years ago. But I found out from the days of Charles I, we've got, like, five or six hundred years of mental illness um, inherited. So, from when I was about 12, I was very depressed as a child. But I used to clown around. I was like manic depressive. I, and so at school, I was always on a high, but at home I was very dark. So I suffered from um, clinical depression for probably 25 years, but didn't know it. Because like schizophrenia, nobody diagnoses it. I just knew that I was weird. Um, I, I just used to do weird things. I mean, um, such as? Um, Alright, for instance, um, when I was, I broke my leg fighting. I, I was a youth who could never fight. I'm one of them youths who couldn't fight. But I, I behaved like I did. But I was one of them, is there any men in the room that, you know when you play table tennis, and you say best of three? Yeah. And you, somebody beats you 2 1, and you go best of five, yeah, yeah. best of seven. And then the moment you win one more, you say, that's it, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's me. My rules. So, for me, I was always, I was always the child that would do strange things. And when I was about 13, I broke my leg fighting. And they took me to see Shakespeare. And uh, I loved it. And, and I got dished for all the black people at school. Because to me, uh, Leonard Rossiter, famous actor, yeah, was, yeah. Richard III, there was a scene where he pulled the sword out. And um, I remember I had a broken leg and my leg was full plaster, sticking up like this. And, he pulled the, the sword out and it went into the audience. And in a Richard III voice, he came out of character or came into the audience and he just said, uh, Excuse me, kind sir, would you give me the sword back so I can continue in the play? And I thought, you no. Know, I didn't do that. Anyway, when I got back to school, I remember, can you remember at school when you had All Things Bright and Beautiful? Yeah. All Things Bright and no. Beautiful. Well, for me, I realised when I was at school, because I wanted attention, so the teacher would say, right, I need someone to read from Wuthering Heights. And I had an English teacher who was a traditional Cambridge educated English teacher. So he would call you by your last name, Glyn, I want you to read page 32 to 33, like this. So everybody in the class, when they would read, they'd read in a monotone voice. They'd say, and Heathcliff came through and went into the, like this. I wasn't like that. I said, Heathcliff came into the room, shut the door with a bang. Doof. Suddenly the wind was blowing. <laughs> <laughs> See? So I found myself in an English lesson being able to dramatize. So I became a prefect at 12. By 13, I was a public speaker. By 15, I was head boy. And I'm not going to lie, I, read the, I ran the school like the mafia. Because what I did, when I was head boy, I was allowed to recruit other prefects. <laughs> and at the time, yeah, because my stepfather was tough on me, I had this issue with white people. So I, I'd say became head boy. So I used to get, you know at school, remember wet breaks? Yeah. And you get the prefect and go, so I got all my black friends here, yeah, and they just get all the white people out when it was raining. That's what I used to do. So I, I developed leadership as young as 15. Now that was unusual, because I could speak in public, and then what happened is, as a consequence of that, I started to politicise. I've never kind of, the 23rd Psalm, Yea, thou walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. I've never kind of feared doing something different. Whereas I never understood why people would just do boring things. I remember I used to tell, I never had any money at school. Kids would come in and say, my dad won't give me any money. We used to sell pot bottles, because back in the day, you had pot bottles and you get like six months or something like pot bottles. So what I used to do is go and tea for the pot bottle. Because you used to leave them outside your house, Corona. Yeah. They leave them outside the house. So what we do, you get a bag. And we just go around and tea for the bottles. And that's how I get my pocket money. And then if you want to go out with a girl and take pictures, you couldn't go out with a girl and say, I'll see you inside. 
So then I could take the girls to pictures because I had a little bit of change in my pocket. But I never got no money because my dad was, my dad fought in the Second World War and I remember, you know like Oliver Twist? And Oliver Twist that says, please sir, can I have some more? My dad fought in the war. And if you, you know, my dad was a, my stepfather was a white Irish East Ender. This guy pulled out all of his own teeth. That's what he was like. So I go to him and say, can I have some money to go to the city centre? And he'd say, in 1945, when I was walking 20 miles a day in the heat and then in the night it was cold, do you think I had any bus fare? And I'm like, eight. I'm like, eight. Okay. That's a no -go. Food. If you eat food, you talk about black people. If I leave my food, if I said, I'm not, I hate meat. My mum could never cook meat. I only discovered meat when I met black people. My mum could not cook meat, so I couldn't eat that meat. <laughs> but you leave it there, you come back the following day, the meat's there. Because you say, 1945, did they see? That's the running joke. So for me, I was just always doing stuff. I mean, strange things happened. We went on a school trip. And all the kids at school come with a weekend suitcase, right? A weekend suitcase to go camping. My mum and dad brought a trunk. Big trunk. And this is my mum to the bus driver. Make sure he changes his underpants every day. See, so it got around the school that my mum was, um, my mum would come to school and say to the teacher, Did he, does he wear his vest? Is his underpants clean? You know, it's like that. So, yeah, so, so what I'm dealing with is, is, and so I got this reputation of being eccentric. And the one thing my mum taught me, I couldn't fight. I'm not going to lie, I couldn't fight. But my mum told me verbal abuse. She said, the only way you can fight yourself is to defend yourself in the mouth. And I knew at school, you know when your parents tell you, you must come in at 12. I realised, when they tell me to come in at 12, I'm still going to get hit one, two, three, I'm going to beaten. So I used to come in late. I realised at school, they're going to beat me anyway. So I give them a reason to do it. So, you know, I'd be cheeky. And the guy said, I'm going to wait for you after school. You know, they'd nickel me, wait for me after school, 15 guys. And the one step forward, he's about to hit me. I say, yo, before you stop, you were so ugly when you were born, the doctor went over and slapped your mum. You were so ugly when you were born, the doctor went over and slapped your whole family. I've seen a better face on a clock. When I look at your face, I believe in life after death. See, and he'd say, and he's just about to hit me, and he realised everyone's laughing at me. So I developed a fierce reputation. So, so I, that's how I learned to defend myself, verbally. You wear many hats, because yes, you're a criminologist, but you also playwright, the author, the yeah. stand-up comedian. Yeah. Uh, tell me, how did you get into stand-up comedy? Was it through being beaten up? No, no, listen. Um, sad life. Tell me. Comedy comes from tragedy. And um, what would happen with me is, I don't know if it's my voice, because there's certain men that will come up to you and say, classic example, when, when a black man tells you he's finished with his girl, and he's upset. There's, he come up and he's saying, Yo, boy, what girl's left, you know, man? <laughs> you know, it's like this. And when I thought about my life, right, when I'm t I've been telling friends of mine, right, it's a true story. I know we've got young kids in it. But to show you what my kind of comedy is like, because I don't write jokes, um, I had a hemorrhoid operation. And it didn't work. And um, one of my brethren is in Nottingham. I remember going up to him and I said, and I was distressed. Anybody here that read hemorrhoids? It's not nice. It's painful. Especially when you have an operation. Anyway, I thought I got to tell somebody. Because if you tell women, there's a kind of empathy. Because and the other thing is, never tell a black woman or a woman that you've just had it internal. Because by the time you've had one, she's had about 50. So that didn't get out too well. Anyway, on stage. And the one thing that happened is, and this is about leadership, because what I realised is, a lot of people in our community have no voice. And they wait for certain people to say, well if Martin can talk about it, so would I. So I developed this thing called the Truth Chair, which we get from psychotherapy, where at the moment I've been working on prostate cancer. <coughs> now, because I do public health research, it's very hard to get eight men in a room and say, talk about prostate. So what I do, I talk about my experience as a prostate, and we have a truth chair, and anybody that comes up sits on the chair tells the truth. So I use comedy as a release valve, like in prison. Um, prison cube is very strange. I'm the person that has to say to a guy, 
Reggie, you're going to get a 35 year sentence. Now, you think, what's funny in that? Nothing. Nothing. But when I come in, there was a guy, this guy got a year, got a year sentence. Every day he come in, he's like, oh man, I got a, he got a year, 12 months. But there's another man got 15. 15 years. And every day he come into the session, he's just like, cool. Cool, is it? Just cool. The other guy's got a year. He's like, what? And he said to him one day, Bridget, I got a year yeah, he's killing me. You got 15, why are you so cool? He says, because I should have got 30. So when I go into a prison situation, when I'm in a prison situation, and a man says, he said, yeah, I've got 15, you know. It's, it's, you know. I said, really, at least it's not 30. And he go, eh, you got a point there. So for me, humor, when you give people bad news, my mum, I told my mum she was dying. And when the funeral was on, my mum was like the funniest woman I've ever met. She never tried to be funny, but I tell you what my mum was like. Two weeks before she died, a nurse came up to my mum. And I tell this in stand-up comedy, because I believe in talking about taboo subjects in a funny way. And this was one where two weeks before my mum died, a nurse came up to my mum and says, Mrs. Glynn, would you like a yogurt? And my mum says, is it low fat? <laughs> so, mum says it low fat. Um, anyway, when I told her she was dying, it was hard to tell her. And she said, she told me, she said, go and get this book. And it was a book. She'd sort the funeral out. And she goes, I want to say something before, before you go any further. I know you're upset. Because I was like, oh, you're dying. And she said, look, Martin, I'm dying, you're not. Right? I said, I know. And she said, no. She said, look, at the funeral, I don't want any flowers. I'm horrified. What do you mean I want no flowers? She says, what can I do with them? She said, no singing. Why? I can't hear it. <laughs> anyway, the whole black community come out to my mum's funeral. Now it's a white woman. A whole black community come out. They brought flowers, but they were sent to a hospice. Anyway, we get to the graveside. You know, everybody's expecting to sing Rock of Ages. And I got to the grave, and I just said, right, that's it. And then all black people was like, what? No singing. I said, one minute, no singing. She said she didn't want to sing. So, in, in a way, my humor, one is a coping strategy, but I've just found a technique to kind of break it down using humor to say the harshest. Harshest. I'm around people that do terrible things. And the only way I can get them to talk them off the ledge is, is, is through humor. Now, you're saying, um, so you did your humor, your comedy. And I presume you went down well. Sometimes. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's inappropriate. Um, I've made mistakes. Um, I've been into prisons where I have such a good time, I forget I'm in prison. And, and break time, so what we're doing at break time? You know, like we can go out for a walk, um, pointing your finger, that's not, you don't do that in prison, you don't go, what are you trying to say? Um, yeah, so I've, I've said inappropriate things, like going into a prison and taking your holiday snaps out. Who you guys said you love? You know, um, oh, that I've had that. Recently I had a guy, he, he, he slightly saw the funny side. Somebody said, normally what I get, like somebody like yourself might have a son who's 15, can't talk to him. So then there's you, yeah, and he's got that kind of afro with a hat. You know like the baseball caps on top of the afro? <laughs> he just comes back from court and his youth worker was saying, Mark, he's terrorising the place, can't talk to him. Can you talk to him? I said, I don't know him. What am I supposed to say? I walked up to him and I said, Reggie, you just been to court. He said, yeah. And I'm a father. I hate when they that. Yeah. Or yes, blood. I don't want to hear that. Anyway, I said to him, um, you got, are you got a woman? He goes, yeah. I says, if you get put down for a year, your brother is going to be leading over your girl. He said, I'll take care of her. How are you going to be if you don't have sex for a year? And he went, Oh my God, I never really thought about that. <laughs> I said, what do you think prison is? You think you can have sex with your girl in prison? I said, don't worry about that then. And he's like, yo, Martin, Martin, hold it down, man, hold it. No, I said, no. So let's talk about your behavior now. I said, hold on, have you got a knife? So you do realize you're gonna do a five year census. So let me think, five years. See, when I go up tonight, I'm gonna hold my girl. We're gonna watch TV. But you, how much do you weigh? And he said, about 130 pounds. I said, well, imagine when you go to a wing in prison, 
four guys, 230 pounds, they'll take one arm, one arm, one leg, one leg, and then the fifth man's come along, greasy and horrible. And uh, all I say, don't bend down. Oh God, Mark, he's going, oh my God, what are you trying to say? <laughs> and you can see, everybody's laughing. You can see the youth now, he's like, and, and I said, what, well, Reggie, you do what you need to do. And then he said, yo, man, you broke it down. They come and talk to you. So what I'm dealing with is, is that I just specialise in giving people bad news in a kind of humorous way. Because you were saying that whenever you go into prison, you've been into prison quite a few times? 35 years. Okay, wow. Now, you say, and this is the bit I found very hard to understand, or even get in my head, the bit where you say that you don't have no guards with you. No, I work on supervised. On supervised? I've never worked. Yeah, because what I'm asked to do in prison, um, the, the kind of things I'm asked to do, a lot of the times, um, it's with very high risk. Murder, rape, terrorism. The way prisons work, it's a bit like, the, it's like your parents being in the room. They just don't want people in there. Um, I've just done a year in Stafford Prison where, do you remember Lee Rigby? The guy that was murdered by the two guys. Well, I was interviewing some soldiers from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Northern Ireland, and they felt it was a bit risky. Why? Well, because two Muslims had murdered him. And like the police, the guy that got released just, or was going to get released, who murdered three policemen. Soldiers are very protective. So I'm having to go on to interview people on an anxiety management program, and a lot of them are soldiers. So they said it might be risky because if they think you're a Muslim, they might kill you. So I thought, what I'm going to do? Anyway, the way that I did it, you're not supposed to do this. But I remember because I, I had to do the research, I was worried that because of Lee Rigby's death, that the timing of me going in was just not appropriate. Because I do, you know, when people are traumatized and locked up. Anyway, we arranged a meeting with the guy that ran the prison. This is a guy. The, the, the most profiled prisoner. And we had a secret meeting and he was on the anxiety management program, which was ironic because this guy's a guy, when he got released last time, three pubs in Liverpool were empty. That's how bad he was. And it was just me and him. And he's one of them guys that said to prison officers, I want to talk to him, so it's just me and him. Anyway, the first week I went in, it was pretty difficult. I got threats and all sorts of stuff. Well, there was, a, there was one guy, a particular guy called Matt Baz, and he was, he was like psychotic. And in the first week, he threatened me. He just walked in and he said, if you're upset, I'm, I'm going to punch your face in, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting next to this guy. Anyway, after a couple of weeks, he wanted to talk to me. And we're in the group. And what would happen is, each, each guy would say, can I talk to you? And my thing is, where do you want to talk? So that outside. And we go outside, so we don't want to sit. So they'll, they'll sit you like, imagine I'm here, sitting in the corner and he's there. Because what they're basically saying is, if we don't like what you're saying, we're going to jump you. So, how do you feel in situations like that? Do you go? Or do you not? No, I don't, I don't feel that. I can't go into a shop. If some, I, I remember working with some paedophiles. <coughs> I was working with some paedophiles one time and I went on a train. And I had a picture of my son, because normally when I'm working with men, I take a picture of my son out and I say, yo, this is my son, you know. And with the paedophiles, I couldn't do it. And I remember I was in a maximum security prison and I met what's called natural lifers. These are people that will, they, they stay in prison for the rest of their natural life and the kind of things they do is unspeakable. And with paedophiles, I'm not a target. They all said, do you want a cup of tea? Do you want a chair? They're like you, they're courteous. Anyway, the impact was so extreme. I was on a train and somebody was opening a packet of crisps. There was two people, remember there's the, the executive on the train. Hello, Steve, it's me, John, hi, yes. There was that and there was somebody opening a packet of crisps. And I sat down there and I remember, and I can feel myself, my chest starts vibrating. My fist starts clenching and I just went forward and said, Do you know that went like that? So what you do, the the energy that they project, you internalize. You can't show it to them. You cannot show it, it's too dangerous. But you discharge it. 
So in the early days, I would go, I couldn't speak for two weeks. I'd sit looking at the ceiling. Um, intimacy, it destroys your intimate relationship. You cannot, you don't want to be touched. I like, for instance, if you work with pedophiles and they come and hug you, you just feel like, no matter how many showers you have. So, you tend to disconnect, you become isolated, you become abrasive, aggressive, you internalise and you become depressed. And everything around you becomes, you become sensitised to everything. Because what you would, to you, having a normal conversation is just, to, to me, that was like, I used to resent people just, because I just couldn't discharge the feelings. I remember working with a guy in the IRA. There's a guy, he was part of the real IRA. The Omar Bombers, he was one of them. Um, and I've got a group of black men. They've all got life sentences, but it was a black men's only group. Now you laugh when I tell this, black men's only. This white guy comes in. Now, in the community, it was a group of black men and a white guy walks in. It's like, yo, what's in it? You know, it's like that. Anyway, he walks in and he sits down. And I'm like, these black guys are hard. But there's something that got quiet. They all went. So I'm like, freaking hell. Well, you need to come into my class more if you can get order like this. Anyway, I heard his voice. And it sounded a bit like Ian Paisley. Martin, you Martin. So yeah. But they were they looking at each other like, you know, like primary school, like. I don't have a word, Martin. So I suddenly realised who it was. So we sat down and said, look, you love just to amuse yourself. So he sits down and he, he pulls a book out. And I think, what's he going to talk about? He says, I want you to look at this. He says, I've written some love poems for my wife. He's just blown people up. And he's asking me to look at love poems. And he's saying it in a way, anybody who's menacing, they don't shout. He's, you can always tell a black you two is not bad or you bad. He said, yo, you come on, no, no, come on, come on, yeah, come on. <laughs> Somebody who's dangerous don't do that. They just say, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> or, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> and that's what he was doing. And what he was doing is psychologically trying to get in, try to control the way I felt. So, in effect, when you go into these environments, these situations. Why do you put yourself through that? It, I, I, can I, is it, how many mothers are there in the room? Show me mothers and fathers and parents. <laughs> I, I'll explain it. If you said to me, would I like a four bedroom detached house, a bigger car, comfortable life? Yeah, I would. But, I want to give you a scenario. It's really important to say this. Did you hear about Oscar Pistorius? Culpable homicide. Culpable homicide is based on provocation. I was asked to comment on it, and I found a similar case in America about a South African man who had raped and murdered a girl in the same way, charged with culpable homicide, got 40 years. The relevance of it, in domestic violence cases and rape, women will not come forward because for the same reason as Oscar Pistorius, it's his word against hers. The relevance of it is this. Let's take a man who rapes. If he gets a 10 year sentence and he's coming out and he raped a teenager, if he's had rehabilitation, if he's had somebody like me, if you can sustain that for 10 years, the likelihood of reoffending is drastically reduced. So if you've got a 17 year old sister and a guy who's raped someone, like the footballer that came out, yeah? If he's had good rehabilitation, he'll see your sister at 11 o'clock at night at a bus stop and get on a bus. No rehabilitation, he's going to rape and kill his sister. Do you hear about the young girl that got murdered the other day? It's the same thing a dustbin man does. It's the same thing a toilet cleaner does. It's just that we live in a society where we're not facing a bowler. We live in a society which is quite sanitised. And my position is, I just have a real issue with the lack of understanding. She came and spoke to me. 
As a consequence of her speaking to me, she's now gone back into her family and she's now gone into therapy. It's easy now, but somebody's got to do it. And, and for me, I'll be honest with you, it's a bit of a privilege to be able to engage with people that nobody talks to. I've worked with AIDS victims, cancer, heroin, crack. So from my point of view, I'm fortunate that I've just found a way to discharge my distress. I don't ask for medals or... This is why coming here is a bit strange for me because this is not what I'm used to. But the reality of it is, we live in a society that's selfish, we don't know the next door neighbour, we don't know the toilet cleaner. When I did my PhD, I used to go in at 6 o'clock in the morning until 6 at night. It was the toilet cleaners, it was the people who put the paper in the photocopiers. So when I passed my PhD, the first people I went to talk to was the cleaners, the people at the field. The academics, I didn't talk to them because they weren't supportive. So for me, I don't want anybody to go through what I went through. So I think deep down inside, I'm just, I just care for people. Um, and, and it's as simple as that. I, I, I don't care what the person is. I work with people. I love working with people who are racist, right? I, no, I work a lot with people who are racist, right? Who, like the big thing at the moment is UKIP, because I have to do a lot of analysis on party politics. And I, when you meet a racist, um, I met a guy recently in a prison, white guy. So this is what happens, you come in, it's a Dr. Martin Green. So white guy goes in, so you're a doctor, yeah? So yeah. What kind of doctor are you? I've got a bad back, can you fix it? <laughs> so no, but if you get stabbed or kidnapped, I can explain how it happens, you know? <laughs> he said, what are you then? Doctor, I said, doctor of philosophy. What's that? But when you happen to have to counsel him, you get a different perspective on racism. And what you realise is, and the way I, you know I tell you talk about humour? Guy says, I met a black guy one day, he says, I hate white people. Can you get that? Black guy, hate white people. So you hate white people? He said, yeah. And he looked at me and said, are you half white? Ah. I said, yeah. I said, That's all right then, you know. Anyway, I said, hey, for white people, yeah? Yeah. I said, okay, you've got an appendix problem. So black guy, I said, you're on a, you're on a stretcher, belly's open. Black guy comes up, baseball cap, gold tooth, baggy trousers, says, yo, yo, blood, I'm going to operate on your appendix. Nah, nah, I ain't man like that. I said, well, if it's a middle-aged white guy, 55, and his name is Professor Robert Stevenson. Yeah, yeah. I said, so you don't hate all white people. You hate the judge. You hate white people in authority, the head teacher. And when we traced it back, he got kicked out of school from seven. So by him understanding that at the age of seven, he was verbally abused by white guys, he's carried it all his life. Then we had to sit down and say, Brendan, it's time to let it go. The saddest thing is when you see an individual who carries hatred, you have to let it go. Whether it's a black person, and black when you see a white guy, you see a white guy who will be as racist as hell, and then I'm the first black person that's been compassionate with him. And he doesn't know what to do, because he's never ever met someone that's been compassionate. So, for me, I just don't care what you represent, I'm going to break that resistance down. I'm going to, you see, the problem with you is you're so interesting that I could talk and talk and talk. And there's so much that I know about yourself that I want to also bring out of you so the audience can hear. But I also want to get the audience a chance to put questions to you. But also, there's also your 777s. I'll give you them then. But I want to ask you, before you get to that, I wanted to, you to explain to the audience when you went to America, because you worked with a couple of gangs. Yeah, I worked with the Crips and the Bloods. Now, have, you, have you all heard of the Crips and the Bloods? When it comes to gangs here, yeah, I work with all the gangs in the country, but one of the ways I get, if you ever want to work with gang members, it's like chess. You can't get credibility unless you work with a gang worse than them. And the Crips and the Bloods, they're like premier division when it comes to gang. And I work with the Crips and the Bloods. I didn't intend to work with them. But I, I'm one of them people, I just happen to, I'm always in the wrong place at the right time, or the right time. And this particular case in America, yeah, I worked with a guy that had been shot 15 times, shot his leg off, his name's Buff. And I like the name Buff, because I remember when I was growing up, Buff. You know, that's how I can speak about Buff, you know what I mean? 
Um, but yeah, I work with the critics, the bloods, um, and the interesting thing when I'm working with profiled gang members, the one, what I've learned is, as a rule of thumb, is I behave like a five-year-old. So I always ask them the question, you know, like a lot of you lot, you want to ask a question, but you'll never ask the question you want to ask. I'm the one that asks the question, like I'll say, yo, Bridget, how did you lose your leg? Right? And they'll say, shot 15 times. And I remember right at the end of the interview, it was frightening. You know, I was bricking it, my knees were shaking, I felt I wanted to get to toilet. But I remember at the end of it, I said to him, is it worth it? And he just lifted his shirt up and I saw 15 bullet holes. I mean, it was just a whole chest. And he survived. And, um, and the interesting thing is, is what I managed to do is uncover who he was. Because there's a what you are and who. So what I've learned is to develop a technique is to find out who they are. And what, I, what he told me, what most gang members tell me, there's two types of gangs, hedonistic, drink, smoke, like you see in hip hop videos, but there's the counterculture ones. This guy just said, my parents kept, my grand, great great parents came as slaves. I've got family mem members who were lynched, who marched with Martin Luther King, who saw Malcolm X, and yet they still shoot three, three of us dead a week. So you see with us, and he said, the differences between us and what you do over here. So he said, don't get it twisted. We die for this. But he never, you know, they didn't glorify what they did. They didn't talk about what they said is, we are America's worst nightmare because America was our worst nightmare. And, and this, this is no word of a lie. We went to the Jamaica School of Dance and Drama. Um, my cousin said, if it's a police come, where is the police come? Don't look on them. No but I look on the police, but I police you know, I'm going to beat you. <laughs> police come along. I'm with this guy called Crampy from West King. Hey, look on the police. Come on. Three of us, come on. AK-47 <coughs> resting on his shoulder. Man with a bat. And say, yo, where you come from? So Cramp said, yo, downtown, sir. I, I come from downtown. What you doing up here? Well, I, I come to see my friend. Then. Come up to my cousin. Yo, where you come from? Well, I really got talk, we just didn't roll a car last day. He come up to me. You, where you come from? Light skin boy, red skin boy, where you come from? I said, I'm from England. <laughs> <laughs> so he come up to me now and he said, where you come from? And I thought, okay. Up this sir. He said, better you say that. Next time you see him. <laughs> see? So, now, the relevance of it is this. There's a serious point to this. In sociology, there's a guy called Michael Foucault. Michael Foucault is the person, you know we say language is power. Language is power. So on the, in the streets, if you don't have the language, you have no power. When it comes to middle class white people, if you don't have the language of power, so one of the things I've developed over the years is to understand the power of language. Whether I'm on the streets, when, if you sit with my son, and he's like, yo, look, I can still speak like this. I can, yo, what are you trying to say? But when I'm lecturing, I will put the G and speak with an intonation like this. But if I'm speaking at the Conservative Party conference, as we do, as we're raising our voice, it is very clear. But when I'm telling a little child a story, you talk to them like this. So what I realized is my greatest asset that I protect is not my legs, my body. It's this and this. And that's why I said if it was a science fiction scenario and you broke into a, a, a planet, all you'd see with me is this. Where's, where's Dr. Glynn? I'd just be a brain in a jar connected to some wires. <laughs> because what I've realized is, and I was asked earlier about mental health, is that Having, trying to protect your brain is like an athlete who has to train every day. And if you don't, and that's why a lot of us get ill, because we do not stimulate the brain to stop it from shutting down and stuff like that. So I found by working in criminal justice, how to communicate on so many levels that it keeps me active, but it also- You said you met the top guy in one of the gangs, I'm not sure if it was the Crips or the Bloods, yeah. and he was, you asked him a question, he asked if you've got a uh, son, and you, I think you asked him. No, what I said to him, um, one of the problems I have with 
the way we understand the street culture <coughs> is in the NHS, you have what's called the expert patient. If you've got a problem with your belly, you understand the condition. When it comes to crime, we don't feel to ask criminals because they're the experts on criminal behaviour. So when it comes to, he was a gang leader. And we all talk about, and doing Derby, because I've been called to Derby when you've had a shooting. You people phone me up and say, Martin, how can we stop gangs? I, I said, have you ever spoke to a gang member? Anyway, I was with him and I just said to him, Bridget, how can I stop my son from joining the gang? And I said, no, let me clarify, my son was here, how could I stop him, you, from recruiting my son? Now at the time, Michael Gove was the Education Secretary. And this is another important point I want to make. He turned around and said to me, keep your son in the house and educate your son. My work in Baltimore was about father absence. I came back to the UK and realised father absence cost the country $46 billion a year. I then looked at the education system and realised that in America, when an African American boy fails as young as five SATs, they build a new prison. Michael Gove, 10 months ago, talked about testing children as young as three. Remember? Yeah. And we all said, stupid. Well, let me tell you, current criminal justice policy, as a criminologist, if your child fails as young as four, they will come into contact with the criminal justice system by 16. So what I realized, what Buff was saying to me is, we will take any youth who is not parented correctly and doesn't have a decent education. And what do we see in this country? The only people gang members will recruit is if your dad ain't around and bad education. Which means that when you've got free schools, academies, as parents, all you've got to do is educate your kids, keep them light, don't do what the McCanns did. I'm sorry, I'm not a big lover of what the McCanns did, because to me, when my son, when we were going shopping, I would tap, I don't, you know when you've got kids who like hang around your leg, you know you're kind of walking like this. And flipping. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I've studied gangs. Right now, the average age of a gang member is 12. And I can tell you how easy it is to recruit gang members. So one of the things that you can do in a place like Darwin, you get all the men together and say, yo, where's your kids? Because I know the men that I know, they, they would never trouble my son. Because they said he's got a positive father, a positive influence. But they'll give that youth a space. So for me, I tend to learn a lot more common sense from people who are on the opposite side of the fence than any intellectual, trust me, you know what I mean? And when I wrote the book, I wanted to give that a platform because all the best advice I have never comes from intelligent people because intelligence is not common sense and sense is never common. So I don't really take advice from intellectual people. You, you mentioned your books, uh, how many books have you written now? Why, I've written about 13 poetry books, about seven children's books. This was a labour of love because me being me, when I did my PhD, my examiners and my supervisors said I'd never get a book deal. So what I did, a year before I, I, I finished, I got in touch with Ravage. A year, but I never told anybody. But the day that I passed, I got a book deal. So I went around, yeah, they said I'd never get it. And I wanted to get to the world's leading publisher because I wanted to be like you. I wanted to know what you said Bob felt like. Everybody said, go to this publisher. I went to the world's biggest publisher on academic publishing. I got a book deal. So for me, and I've never read it. I'll be honest, I've never read my book. <laughs> no, it's, it's like looking in the mirror. I, you know, it was the journey towards the book. So, um, and I've just finished the second one. And your second book's called? It's called Tales from the Ebony Tower. <coughs> because to me, we talk about the ivory tower. That's middle class white men. Ebony Tower is our black person who's from the road, who does a PhD. Middle class white men, they see it as like going to darkest Africa and conquering knowledge and going through this angst-ridden, painful journey. Mine was full of reggae, hip-hop, rice and peas, green banana, madness. So I've written an autobiographical account of the Ebony Tower to give inspiration to young youths from the road who feel that you've got to be posh 
to do a PhD, and it's something about that. Yeah. So your books are available to get from where? That's 85 quid. This one here? Yeah. Uh-huh. 85 pound or... Mm -hmm. say, just say that with an exaggerated time. Uh, 85 pounds. You know what I love about that? Uh -huh. I, I say to my students, how much does a decent pair of trainers cost? And you know. So, you know, a book is for life. So, at the end of the day, um, the way I see it, if you buy Kentucky every week, um, in Birmingham, right? No word of a lie. I'm one of those people, like, I, would, I would tell the black community what I think about them. And I was comparing a show one day, just to show you how bad it can get. I was bored. And I wanted to show, some, somebody said to me, is the black community really that apathetic? I said, let me show you. So I had a thousand people and I said, do you want the good news first or the bad news? They said, give us the bad news. I said, they're shutting Kentucky down in Hansworth. And everybody, oh my God, I can't believe it. And they said, well, what's the good news? I said, they're building a new library. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, can I say to people, I've got three and a half thousand books. So my whole life has been spending books over the last 40 years. Um, ignorance, say bliss. And unfortunately, during Black History Month, you wouldn't be able to read about black history if you didn't read books. It's just that most of us, we don't like writing, we use Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I'm saying that we need to write. It's good for your health, it's good for your brain. This is a legacy. Because you see when we dead? Still here? Yeah, Simple as that, you know what I mean? If, if you can have an album. Well, let me tell you the psychology of a book. When I go in prison, if I walk in this album with five albums, I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. The moment you pull that out, you just put your bit. So for me, and even today, right, I've got my notepad. When everybody's bringing out the iPad, I've got my notepad. <laughs> you know, so from my point of view, no, books, critical, critical. Fantastic. Now, can we show the first seven, seven? I'm not sure what we're looking at first. I'm going to try and whisper these as well as possible because I'm going to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. I'm um, on to the part, found the book, Matisse Perry. She had a chat show before Oprah. Um, I'm one of them people, I buy lots of books. If I like the book, I get in touch with the author. I got in touch with her, so I'd love to adapt it. I converted it into a screenplay. She flew me to America. She lives on a plantation. She's the, she's the illegitimate daughter of um, a very famous soul star. We had a, a pitch meeting at Paramount Studios. We had Jay-Z, all these people involved in it. And then the Hollywood writer's strike came in and killed it off. Um, it's a very unusual story. It's a hip-hop ghost story with a twist. So, um, but she's very famous. I just emailed her. I love your book. I wrote the script, flew me to America, and that's how I got connected to Savannah in Georgia, just outside Atlanta. No problem. Thank you. Next one. Aesop's Fables is because I'm a storyteller and that's how I get all my stories. And the other thing about Aesop's Fables, they're short. So when you're in prison, you know, yeah, black, you know, you two say that's a long thing. Aesop's Fables are short, so they're brilliant. So I love Aesop's Fables, they've got a lot of wisdom in there, they're timeless. And the other thing I like about Aesop, he was a slave. One of the world's greatest ever storytellers, he was a slave. So it demonstrates that you can be a slave and become great. Fantastic. Okay, seven influential people. My son, I wrote a poem. Um, I was a father at 16. My oldest daughter, Formula, texted me the other day. She's 40 next year, 40. My other daughter's 33, and my son's 18. I became a lone parent when he was six. And uh, you know like Will Smith's um, um, In the Pursuit of Happiness? Mm. Well, when my son was six, me and him was in an eight by 10. And one day I was crying because I felt I'd let him down. And at the age of seven, he crawled up to me and I, he said, what's up, Dad? And I said, I feel ashamed. It's just, look where we are. And he goes, Dad, I just want to be with you. 12 years later, he's 18. He's exactly the same. And I wrote in a poem, my son gave birth to me. So for me, if my son was here right now, I'd be nothing without him. Because he stuck with me through, from he was six to 18. He was there when I did my masters, my PhD. He's been through the depression. He's picked me up when I'm low. I've had to, he's parented me at times. And now, he's up and running, he's six foot four, 15 stone. Everybody loves him. I, I hate the fact he's better looking than I was. <laughs> but the reason I put him at the top of my list 
is because without him, you know, no disrespect to my other daughters, but I wasn't the kind of father then I was with him, but he enabled me to pair him for the first time. Ira Aldridge, um, first black British actor, played every Shakespeare role. Why he was a hero to me, back in the day, white actors, when they played Othello, would black up and leave their hands white. Ira Aldridge, when he played King Lear, yeah. whitened up his face and kept his hands black. When he played Othello, he didn't put no makeup on, and the actress who played opposite him thought that he was a white person who blacked up. When they found out that he played all the major Shakespearean roles, they brought a surgeon over from France who measured up his skull and his feet because they didn't believe a black person could play that role. Kevin Spacey's theatre that he, he managed in London was the theatre where he started. The Royal Shakespeare Company in, in um, Stratford has a chair donated by the NAACP with his name on it. So any black person who goes into acting owes Ira Aldrich the biggest step because he played every Shakespearean role and he was called the African Roscus and Roscus was a Roman senator. That's what the acting fraternity, they never called him Ira Aldridge, he was called the African Roscus. They felt that he was like a Roman senator as an actor. And this was at a time when he shouldn't have known it. So he, amazing, amazing guy, amazing. Al Collingham, I've been working with a guy in death row who's awaiting execution for 15 years. I have to put him on my list because he's the only person in the world who sends me a birthday card, Christmas card, Easter card. He's done it for the last 15 years. He's awaiting execution. He was in the cell next to Tukey Williams, but he was executed. Um, he's been a source of inspiration when I get depressed because I've learned how death row works through him. He's never, ever let me down. He's never expressed self-pity. Um, he's been there every step of the way when I lost it. So what I'm dealing with is, and he, he ha because he's locked up 23 hours a day, and he's got a typewriter, he has to make cards and envelopes, and he sends the letters regularly. And I've spent, you know, he sends me poems and advice and guidance. I've sought his counsel, I studied his case. I studied his case, but when nobody would say, when, my, when I was a long period with my son, he was the only one that remembers him. And he's on death row. So to him, when he gets executed, I pledge that I will keep his name alive. Regardless of what he's done, because trust me, when I was at my bottom, it took a guy from death row on St. Quentin to keep me alive. Because I remember one day asking him, I said, Bridget, how do you cope with depression? Because the difference between your depression and mine, you can go out the door and change yours. And then one day in his prison cell, it hadn't rained for months, and a raindrop came in. And he wrote me a letter describing what was in the raindrop. And I thought, I've got no reason to be depressed. That's how. Wow. Wow. Nayati. Um, I went to America in 1985. I was like, a bit like myself. I was a powerful poet. Went to America as an activist. I wrote a poem about apartheid when the apartheid was on. So they said, we want you to read it out. I turned up stormtroopers, rifles. What did I do? The typical British thing. Put it in my pocket, turn around and walk off. Ah. Until somebody said, hey, there's the man from England. Anyway, I did it, came back to England. A friend of mine said, if you want to get involved in the struggle, you need to get involved in talking to prisoners. I had four prisoners wrote to him. He was in prison with George Jackson. Remember George Jackson, famous George Jackson, Soledad Brothers, famous black prisoner, revolution prisoner. He was with him the night he was murdered. He spent nearly 20 years in solitary confinement as one of the Angola Four. Um, he's still in touch with me to this day. Constant source of advice. He was, his name's Colonel Nighty Bolt because during the Black Power era in 1973, he was part of a movement in five American prisons called Blacks on Vanguard, who the task was to exterminate collaborators with the system during the civil rights. For 20 odd years, he fell in love with a woman who had HIV and AIDS in another prison. 
When they both got released at the same time, he nursed her to her death on release, and I became friends with her. He's been my friend for 20 years. 20 years in solitary confinement. You ever seen Shawshank Redemption? He knows that. He's been my friend for 20 years. He's never let me down. Um, he's never asked me for anything. And the letters that we've written to each other is probably a foot high. He used to write 20 page letters on a typewriter. His prison Angola is where you go to die. There's a graveyard. It's one of the few prisons in America. The, the name of the prison was after a slave from Angola. 20 years. Um, and you know what he got? He got a 45 year sentence for stealing a car in Mississippi. And he spent 20 odd years in solitary confinement because an officer got murdered and they blamed him. And he came out, nursed this woman to her death. He's still alive, he makes soap now, and he takes photographs. And I classify him as like, as a brethren. So again, special. John Coltrane. Um, I'm a jazz person. Um, when I hit big depression, I couldn't hear melody. I grew up listening to reggae music, pop music. I couldn't hear melody. I used to listen to John Coltrane, couldn't understand it. It just it sounded like noise until I got depressed. And I understood. But why I picked John Coltrane? Because John Coltrane sort of helped me deal with academia. Because John Coltrane one day played a three hour solo on the saxophone. He played a three hour solo on going to the wings and continue to play, and he'd go home and continue to play. Because he was searching for the meaning of life on that saxophone. He died very young, his teeth dropped out, he was a drug addict, but he was one of the world's greatest disciplined. If you look at Usain Bolt, he took that to a whole new level. And what I got from John Coltrane, he didn't care about the world, he cared about making the world a better place through mastering something that to this day is still seen as the saxophone player, saxophone player. In America, they have the church of John Coltrane. There is a church dedicated to him. So anytime I'm depressed and low, I don't listen to anything other than I sit and listen to him, and he just makes it all better. Because I realize that when my head goes up there, I need to be with someone who can understand it. And not only did he understand it, he, like the other people, they, could, they just, he just gives me a lot of, he produced the kind of work that was hugely influential on me. And he did it uncompromisingly. And he died poor, but his contribution to life was amazing. And I miss him every day. I miss his words. But I carry him in my soul. I carry him into prison. Because he would work like, he was like the black version of Johnny Cash. You know what I mean? He lived in the ghetto. He was with the people. But he succumbed like John Coltrane to, to the culture of drugs. So, uh, Again, something I love dearly. Bob McFerrin. When I was in school, I couldn't sing. I used to get, I always wanted to be in the school choir. Couldn't sing. Got slammed off. Lost my voice. Heard Bobby McFerrin. Um, Bobby McFerrin, you know Bobby McFerrin? Yeah. Vocal improvisation. I was on stage one day, and I was working with a reggae band. And like reggae music, they said, what bass line do you want? I almost went, doo, 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 doo. And, and anyway, they missed it, they got, they got it wrong. And I remember there were about 50 of the people there, and all I started going, bam, 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 bam. I can't remember what I'm supposed to say, but I'm doing do, do, do. See, and I realised that he went on stage with a mic, nothing, just a voice. So what I used to do, when I used to forget my material, or I couldn't remember stuff, I'd go on stage with just a microphone like him and be on stage for two hours with just a blank stage and my voice. And to this day, I listen to him every week because he, again, showed me that you don't need electricity, you don't need Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, you just need to be confident to go out there with nothing. And in prison, I don't have a mic, I don't have a, a, a stage, it's just 15 men all serving life with a voice. And what he taught me is how to conduct voice, voices. So for men who've done life sentences, when they sing, they cry and they sing. 
because he showed me the technique of chanting, singing, and get people to release their distress for him. So I love him for that too. And I watched them last week, was the Nicholas Brothers. The Nicholas Brothers were the world's, they were the influence behind Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, and they never ever got their props until later on in life. And when I was growing up as a little skinny you, I always wanted to tap dance. And what they taught me is, it's a skill. You can't just, you know, you can't, you can't do that. Um, so my reason the question is just to say that it's been a pleasure to hear um, the variety of your vocalizations. And um, it's good to thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, sorry. I think Christina on that as well. Um, I spoke to you before we started the session and uh, I just want to say that some of the stuff that you brought out there tonight has made sense to me. I'm 56, I went into social services and I couldn't understand how I was going to handle being the only black man in the social services sector. Uh, and some of those experiences that you've had, I've had, and I can equate with some of the stuff you said and I want to thank you for being here tonight. Beautiful. Christiana? Says, polite things going on here. What he says? Hello. Um, my question is, having heard you spoken tonight, what's the one thing that we've all heard you know, speak tonight? What's the one message you would want us to take away from here tonight? If there's one thing that you want to say to everybody in this room tonight. It's that simple. Um, I suppose I answer it this way. Um, it's not really a question. It's a question. If I contextualise why I'm going to ask this question, with the Ebola crisis, the disproportionality of prison, mental health, if you put currently the black community into a category of public health, we cost the country too much. So the question I would ask the people first is, where do you position yourself around social inequality? Because the reality of it is, if you're a graduate, only two in three black graduates are going to get firsts. When they do get a job, they're six times more likely not to get a job. So the first thing is about positionality. What I would say though, I remember going to a Christian conference recently, I was invited to talk, at, I'm not Christian, but I was asked to speak at a Christian conference. And the question I asked them, I said, if Jesus died for you, what are you prepared to die for? Because for me, we're at the worst time in our history. So what I would say, it's not really about, I, I'm not one of those people, that, because I'm probably coming from a wisdom perspective, I don't, I'm a philosopher, I'm more likely to pose a question. The question is, what price are we prepared to pay to sacrifice the next generation? Which means it's not about what I'm telling you to do. I know what I've got to do, and I know where I'm standing. What I'm, what I'm concerned about, and I suppose when I see the, the young people here, what are you doing to enable them to become fearless, not fearful? We all sit here and say this, but I've worked with 12 year olds in the mood. I'm working with, if you want a sex offender treatment program right now, I have to show you how many teenagers are. Suicide. We can, young black men commit suicide more than young white men. But suicide for middle class men is on the increase. So for me right now, you've got to do what you've got to do. What I will tell you is the gang members are growing in stature. You can, if you can get elected. Did you hear this morning? Britain's got to pay 1.6 billion. So now, if we pull out of Europe, you think of what you're left with in the economy. If the Welsh and the Scots well, the Welsh and the Irish decide to look at devolution. So I would say, if there's one piece of advice, is, as I, and I'll give you what my gang friend says, don't be a drafts player. Drafts is one move at a time. Be a chess player. Be strategic. If you're doing a degree, do a master's. If you're doing a master's, do a PhD. If you can't get a job, create your own. If your child says, I don't want to read, and you're going to accept that, when I go to my students, I do an exercise on the death penalty and I show my students what somebody looks like when they're being executed. <coughs> what I do, I'm not into the shop business. 
And if you came to me and said, this is the way my son is, I'm going to let him do this, I'd show you the opposite side. Because I also work with rape victims. I'm working with Anthony Walker's family in Liverpool. Ten years after he got a hatchet buried in his head, they're still dealing with it. We're all looking to social services and all these places. I'm saying, study Marcus Garvey. Study independent movements of how we did it. Study Zen. So for me, I'm very clear. What's your position? What are you doing about? And the beauty about me, I'm in a crap life, and I'm talking about a rough life. Nobody can tell me that it's not possible to succeed. But if you say, how did I do it? Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. I haven't been to a party in probably 30 years. I've had a holiday in 30 years. In my PhD, 500 books, 1,500 articles, half a million words in two and a half years. I've sacrificed my kids. Every relationship I've had, I've lost. I've been homeless three times. I gave up my flat last year because I became broke. The PhD, <coughs> bankrupt. So what did I do? I gave up the flat, sold my furniture, sold everything that I've got. So they can't do nothing to me. So what I'm dealing with is, and I don't expect you to do what I'm doing, but what you can't do is say it's because of my difference. Because the disabled Olympics show that you can have both your legs off in Afghanistan and still run. Unless you're like Oscar Pistorius that uses it as a, as a, as a defence for shooting someone dead. So, and I'll just give you some horrible statistics. The prison population at Worms is 86,000. By the year 2020, it will be 100,000. We have more young black men percentage-wise in British prisons than they do in America. Black women get sentenced to bigger sentences than white women for the same crime. White women who are working class are going through ten times worse than they've ever been because we don't really care if she's a prostitute or a woman. So my question is, when I walk around and see affluence, when are we going to address the lead food banks? How the hell can we have food banks in 2014 in Derby, Leicester, London? What we do? So can you see my point? That for me, I don't want you to follow me up because I come from that school that says, if I tell you don't go down there because the man's got a gun and you go down there, you're going to get shot. But if I'm saying to you, based on my experience, we need to do this, and you ignore it, when you phone me and say my son's got a problem, join the gang, I'm not going to talk to you. Because I have too many parents who are trying to mask that they're not parenting their kids and they're attractive to other families. And we don't want to talk about it. So my thing is education, sacrifice, discipline, resilience. And what you need to do is go around Derby and get every man who's disconnected from his kids and put them into schools and make them functional. Because if you don't, and that's the issue. But is my view popular? No, because people are frightened of me. People are frightened of somebody like me. But my question would be, as I said, what are you prepared to die for? And most of us don't have to face that until you come to Birmingham with me. And when some of you pulls a gun out because he's had enough, and you stand out there wetting yourself, not knowing what to do, because he sees you've got a watch on, and he remembers you laughing at him as you drove past him in a car, and he was standing there scratching him on his leg. And that's what I have to do. So I'm just saying, we've got to wake up. But when Malcolm said it, they shot him. When Gandhi said it, they shot him. So anybody that talks about change, Tupac, shot him. Biggie, shot him. Bob Marley, shot him. Women, what do they do? They get assassinated too. So the question is, if we're middle class and you can buy privilege, you don't have to worry about it. But remember, healthcare, obesity, prostate, diabetes, sickle cell, thalassemia, death, death, death. So that maybe that when you talk to somebody like, maybe I'm not the right person to talk to. Because most people say, no, no, it's never going to happen. <coughs> so one of the first things we've got to do is come out and deny. That's all I'm saying. So, sorry to that long-winded way, but it's, it's something close to my heart. It's very close, all right? <coughs> Two more questions. This young man and then the last one. Oh, man's got the mic. Yeah, just a quick one, man. Uh, nice meeting you. Thanks for coming down. Um, what difference do you think you have to be made to people? You talk to people who prison life as people that are in there for out. So what do you actually make to their lives? Also, I'm a big believer that our lives are dictated already for we were born to us. Yep. You know, the government, big brother, the way things are, schooling and so on and so forth. You're, you seem to be on the inside. 
Can you give me some insights on how you see it? Alright, two things on that. What difference have I made? Um, my work at primary schools is done story time. Two years ago I spoke at the Labour and Conservative Party conferences. Um, I did a TV show with David Blunkett. <coughs> when I was growing up, I was very frightened of power. After 30 years of doing this work, I've changed people's lives, but it didn't really change much until I got a PhD. Because then I became one of the world's <coughs> leading thinkers in context. I'm not Albert Einstein. One of the things I discovered in my research is this. For instance, I discovered why black men don't go into therapy, group therapy. Now that may not mean much to you, but when I discovered it, it changed a prison regime because they were saying, we can't get black men into therapy. I researched and found out why. When it comes to gang business, join the riots, I was the one that challenged David Cameron about his perception of 150,000 problem families when I said the Queen has a dysfunctional family. So what I'm saying is, is that in context, my book is on every curriculum around the world, used to be sociology, law, criminology, and cultural studies. So it means that I'm influencing what people study. So from that perspective, but the vast majority aspects of your life, you're influenced by marketing and advertising and food. But when it comes to criminal justice, public health, I've just done a major piece of work on anxiety management and discovered that most men who suffer from anxiety in their 40s, it started when they were eight and nine. So now we're looking at early intervention to reduce the level of anxiety. So, so in that sense, I've learned that. The other thing I've also discovered is, if I meet people who are well known, I get to, I, I get to like them. They send me a letter and they promote me around the world. So now, I'm one of the world leading experts in my field. In America, in the Caribbean, I work with a lot of African scholars. So the one thing I'm doing now is getting hard to access into university. We've got a gang member, ex-gang member now into Cambridge. I've got a road youth who was a youth worker. I'm a supervisor on his PhD. So I get hardcore youths into college. I bring them into my class. Yesterday at lecturing, I brought a son and his mum, he's been to prison for five years for drugs, to come into my class, he now wants to do a degree. So I don't really, the gifted and if, you, if you're gifted and talented, you don't need somebody like me. But if you've got a cousin called Ruben, and he's 27, and he's seen his brethren get shot, and his girls left him, and he started taking heroin, and you had seen him for six weeks, and he's sleeping on his brethren's graveside, and you can't talk to him, who are you going to talk to? That's, what, that's my point. So most of what I do, and I just want to conclude on this thing you talk about inside. Most of what I do, I never see the results. And then one day, I'm sleeping at night, I get two texts, two o'clock in the morning, I sleep with my phone by the bed. Man said, look at this, there's a guy called Jaja Souls, and he's a guy who used to run the PDC crew in Brixton. He goes around now and interviews notorious ex-gang members. This, this, he interviewed this guy, he was bad. And he said to him, what made you give it up? This is a guy that did a huge sentence, what made you give it up? Because well, when I was in Whitemore, maximum security prison, I met a guy called Glyn. We gave him a tough time and he came back and he came back. And he said, he taught us how to be respectful. He taught us the importance of knowledge. He taught us the importance that black history could change the way we think. And that was the first time I'd heard somebody majorly bad recognised my contribution to that individual's life, <coughs> saved people's life because man's life can kill people. So the only insight, if, if you're honest, if you pulled me to one side, Martin, what, what do you recommend? Don't live in fear. If you and your woman, if you and your woman break up and she goes, because you know when there's women that will say it's over, have you ever heard when a woman says we're done? The difference between the word over and done. I've been homeless. I've seen people get stabbed. I've been through all sorts of stuff. But I believe, and what I realise is, the thing that's made me survive is not my physique, it's this. But when you study wisdom, the old man with the grey beard, the storyteller. So all I've become is a storyteller. And a storyteller just needs stories. So the one thing, the only insight I can say, always have a good story. When a man holds you up with a gun, tell him a good story. <laughs> it's a story you should tell him. 
It's not a true story, but this is the type of story I'm talking about. And I've been in this situation. Man comes up, he's vexed. You know them youths on the street, vex. Vex. Comes up to you, pulls you up against the wall. He said, yo, I'm gonna kill you. What's the difference between heaven and hell? And he pinned you up against the wall and he took his knife out. What's the difference between heaven and hell? And then you turn around and, and so you start verbally abusing him. You idiot, you're stupid. And he's about to stab you. I said, stop. And he said, why, that, that's hell. He said, you were prepared to die based on telling me what hell was like. He says, yeah, I was prepared to die if it meant that you understood what hell was like. He said, right, he put the knife down and the man said, that's heaven. So my point is, be a good storyteller but always tell the truth. And a lot of us, men in particular, men are from Mars, women from Venus, you know, it's very hard for us to tell the truth. We do this, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm safe. Cool, no. So it's about being true to what you feel. Be vulnerable. Don't give any excuses. If you're down, you're down. Because if you don't, you're going to get ill. So the only answer I can say, tell stories, be true to yourself, and don't be defined according to everybody else's expectations. Lead, don't follow. Because, you know, a leader without followers is like a river with no water. And if you ain't got no water in your river, you're dry. So that's, that's my inside. There's nothing, you can't get out of a book. People, we've run out of time. Well, Completely inspired. If you at a later date we're gonna get in the video edited, it'll be on our website which is www.mewizen.com according to Sasha. So do look. The next show will be on the 28th of November. Look on the website and tell you who it will be. It's a guy called Rory Lamont. We've run out of time. Thank you, Quad. Oh, please sis, a little gift for Dr. Martin. I need to wear a shirt. Well you are, aren't you? It was a little gift to go with your shirt from us. <laughs>